lunchtime. It is the scariest time of day for a new student. Finding a seat is hard enough, but what food to bring is the difference between social success or social suicide. Luckily, we knew just who to sit with. But anxiety enveloped our minds as we sat down at the wooden lunch table. Our friends pulled out their crustless peanut butter and jelly sandwiches with their freshly washed baby carrots. While we reluctantly pulled out our containers of Khoresh Deficent Jun, a popular Iranian dish that appears to be a mushy brown stew as shown above. What are you eating? Our friends asked in surprise. This was the first time we had to decide between embracing our cultural identity or hiding behind it. Good afternoon, my name is Nina. I'm Nikki. And, and we're, we're twins. twins. Nina and I are Iranian Americans. We were born here, but our parents grew up in Iran. As a result, we were raised in a bilingual house household with Iranian values, giving us a multicultural perspective. And this past summer, we had the opportunity to visit our family's native country. But when we excitedly told our friends about our summer plans, their reactions surprised us. They asked, is it stable there? Or is traveling there even legal? We are here today to shatter misconceptions about Iran and to teach you our culture. So let's start with some icebreakers, move on by gaining some context on how Iran became an Islamic Republic, and finish off by exploring Islamic fashion and President Trump's visa ban. The only time we hear about the Middle East is in the media. And the only time it's in the media is if it's accompanied by images of violence, war, and oppression. However, the media fails to capture what life is truly like in Iran. So let's begin with our first icebreaker question. Raise your hand if you think that camels are a common form of transportation in the Middle East. Ooh, pick me. Let's have it, Nikki. Well, according to ResearchGate, Iran has about 0.5% of the world's camel population. The most common forms of transportation include cars, taxis, motorcycles, subways, and buses. This common stereotype that the entire Middle East is a sandy desert with some camels in it stems from movies we all grew up with, like Aladdin. The next question is slightly harder. Raise your hand if you think Iran is part of the Arab world. Nikki, I think I got this one. So there are 22 countries in the Arab world, and Iran is not one of them. Iranians speak Farsi rather than Arabic, and they have a very different culture, but because of its location, it's often lumped into the Arab world. Iran is actually the second largest country in the Middle East following Saudi Arabia, and it has a population of 80 million people. According to PBS, 70% of this population is under the age of 30, making Iran one of the youngest nations in the world. In addition, Iran is rich with natural resources and has the 18th largest economy in the world. According to The Guardian, Iran owns 10% of the world's oil reserves, produces 90% of the world's saffron, and is the largest exporter of caviar. Next question. Raise your hand if you think that this is what the majority of women in Iran dress like. This is the first image that pops up on Google when you search Muslim women and it is almost always followed by the word oppressed. The article of clothing these women are wearing is called the chador, and in Iran, it is always worn by choice. While many conservative women in Iran do wear the chador, the majority, the majority of them wear much more westernized clothing, as we will discuss later in the presentation. Moving on, it is important to gain a context on how Iran became an Islamic Republic before we go any further. Iran is what remains of the great Persian empire today. It was renamed from Persia to Iran in the 1930s. Since 2000 years ago, Iran has always had a Shah, which is the Persian word for king. The last two Shahs of Iran were extremely progressive in their ways of thinking and wanted to make Iran into more of a progressive European country. However, sometimes they were very radical in their ways of enforcing this law. For example, at one point under Reza Shah's reign, he had ordered policemen to raid the streets and rip hijabs off women in an attempt to modernize the Iranian women. So the problem with this was that Iran was a very divided nation. Half the country was religious and conservative, while the other half supported the Shah's thinking. 
This divide led to the Islamic Revolution of 1978, spearheaded by Ayatollah Khomeini, a conservative Islamic leader who falsely promised the people freedom, equality, and happiness. And citizens blindly followed him without truly understanding his intentions of creating an Islamic Republic. So, what does it mean for a nation to be an Islamic Republic? This means that there is no separation between politics and religion. The most obvious Islamic law is the Islamic dress code, which applies to both men and women. For men in public, they must wear long pants and at least a short sleeve t-shirt, while the law applies more heavily to women as they must cover their entire bodies as well as their hair. I like to think of the Islamic dress code as your winter coat. Here in Michigan, we're very used to cold weather, so think of the Islamic dress as your winter jacket. You put it on when you leave the house, and you leave it on while you're in public, for instance, while you go to the grocery store. But the second you go to your own home or your friend's house, you take it off. Next, well, next Iran has progressed socially in many ways, including its treatment of the LGBTQ population. Iran is actually the country that performs the most gender affirmation surgeries in the world. And people globally travel to Iran for the surgery because of its cheap price and quality. The government also provides financial assistance to any citizens who need this procedure. While Iran is an Islamic Republic, there is a high tolerance for religions. There are Christians, Jews, as well as non-religious people living in Iran. And alongside of the mosques, there are churches and synagogues. As long as you follow the Islamic laws, you can follow whatever religion you desire. Now we're going to talk about Islamic fashion. You've probably heard the word hijab before. This is referring to the Arabic style headscarf, which is the cream colored scarf in the image above. It is usually tightly bound around the face and neck and pinned to the side. You will rarely see the hijab worn in Iran. Most Iranian women wear what's called the rusari, which is a looser scarf that leaves some hair and neck exposed. In Farsi, the terms hijab and rusari are interchangeable. However, they're always referring to the same Iranian style headdress. This image depicts the four major types of Islamic dress. On the farthest left side, you have the hijab, which Nikki just described as the most progressive type of head covering, and it's usually worn with a modest dress or jacket. Next to it, you have the chador. This is the next most common form of dress, and it's what more religious women wear. It is a floor-length veil that leaves the entire face exposed, and contrary to common belief, it comes in many different colors beside black. The next two types of Islamic dress are the more conservative types of dress that are never worn in Iran and rarely worn in the Middle East. First, you have the niqab, which is a floor-length veil that leaves slits for the eyes, and the one next to it is the most conservative type of dress, the burqa. This is a floor-length veil that covers the entire body, and there are nets for the eyes. The burqa and the niqab are only worn in countries like Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan. Many mix up the burqa and the chador. However, there's a huge difference, and it's important to educate yourself as well as your peers to use the correct terminology. Wow, Nikki, look at how fashionable they are. These colorful images are the ones we are never shown in the media. Just like in America, Iranians like to look good. They love brands like Chanel, Gucci, and Louis Vuitton, and Tehran is not only the capital city of Iran, but it is the capital of modest fashion. As a result of the Islamic dress code, there is less emphasis on the female body and body image, and there's a lot more emphasis on facial beauty because that's the only part of the body that's really exposed. And because of this, plastic surgery is a big deal in Iran, and it's a normalized part of society. In fact, Iran is actually the country that performs the most nose jobs in the world. Both men and women receive these nose jobs, and many leave on their bandages for longer than necessary, as it is a status symbol of wealth. So, this, um, so when, on our trip to Iran, there were a lot of tourists. None of them were from America, but there were people from Germany, China, Korea, and Australia. And we even met two girls from Australia that said it was their third time visiting Iran because they enjoyed the food, the culture, and the architecture so much the first two times. On December 4th, 2017, the Supreme Court passed President Trump's full visa ban on predominantly Muslim countries pending appeal. This means that anyone living in Iran, Syria, Somalia, Libya, Lebanon, Chad, and North Korea will not be able to receive a visa to visit the United States. 
It does not matter if your mother is a United States citizen or if your twin sister is, because you will not get a visa. The amount of families being broken up by this visa ban is heartbreaking. To put this in perspective, when we were in Iran, we were on a two-week tour bus, and we made a lot of friends, and one of them was this little 13-year-old boy named Mani. And at the end of our two-week trip, he came up to us, and he said, I'm so excited to hopefully come to your house in America and try McDonald's in the United States for the first time. And this interaction broke our hearts because right now there is no way that Mani can come to the United States. The question I want you to ask yourselves is, what makes you different from someone living in Iran? And the answer is nothing. We are all human, we all have emotions, and none of us get to choose where we are born and what circumstances we are born into. We all believe in something, whether it is Islam, Judaism, or Christianity, or human rights, and we are all immigrants. Whether it's our parents or your great-grandmothers. This past summer, Nikki and I had the amazing opportunity to visit a rich, warm and vibrant culture and we hope that one day you all get the opportunity to visit Iran because it truly is a safe and beautiful nation. Thank, Thank you. you.